Do I have the lawsuit? Yes, I do. We're just going to read the lawsuit word for word. We're going to read the entire thing. We are legal experts. Legally, we must tell you that. We both graduated from law school. Yes. At the top of our respective classes. That's why my Twitter handle is Brandon Esquire Perna. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hey! Let's put the suffix in the middle. <laughs> yes, that's how you do it. Welcome to the That's Good Broncos podcast. The Broncos will be auctioned off for sale. We're going to have a new owner here in Denver, and he's going to inherit a football team that's currently being sued by Brian Flores. I thought maybe if we did a pod uh, about the Broncos this week, Will, we'd be talking about their new offensive and defensive coordinators. No, 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 no. Tom Brady's got to retire today. Then Brian (laughs) Flores has to sue the entire league today. And the Broncos announced that they're going to sell the team today. And also somewhere in there, poor Jimmy Garoppolo and the 49ers are going to look for a trade. And nobody's going to even think about Jimmy G. I didn't even see that news. That's how busy it is. I didn't even see that come up on uh, Twitter or NFL.com, wherever. Yeah. I would retweeted, a, I think, a Bleacher Report gridiron thing that said it. So who knows? But don't forget, today's episode sponsored by DraftKings Sportsbook. Use code DNVR when you sign up at DraftKings. And my coffee company benchwarmerbrew.com you can get 25% off when you sign up for our subscription service and that's the cheapest way to get the coffee shipping is expensive so that basically kind of negates the shipping cost in most areas although somebody tweeted uh, urinating tree and I today and they're trying to purchase our coffee somewhere in Africa and the shipping was $135 (laughs) don't think it's worth it so do you have to anyway. sail the coffee around the Cape Horn or like through the Panama Canal to get it there? You have to dig the Panama, a new Panama Canal every time. Oh, geez. Because there's yeah. a no it's coffee tricky. clause in the canals. Yeah. I mean, we could obviously you and I could spend a whole podcast talking about geopolitics. Oh, and, and why, <laughs> why shipping costs are so high right now. Yeah. Instead, uh, we have to we have to talk about racism and uh, mm-hmm. uh, lawsuits and legalese. Yep, nothing like two white guys talking about racism in the NFL. Two non-athlete white guys talking about whoa, racism. Whoa, 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 whoa. Non-current athletes. Current. We threw athletes. the football together once. Yeah. Will has success. the stronger arm. I have the better arm. I'm just going to put it out there. It's like Montana and LA, yeah. essentially. Pretty much. And just like John Elway, we were both hungover. We were both hung. Yeah, that's what, <laughs> that's what's really funny here. Um, before we get into this, Brian Flores suing the Broncos and the NFL thing, did you watch the uh, Denver Broncos video about the hiring of Hackett, like the behind-the-scenes video they put out? It's like a 20-minute thing. Uh, no, I saw the video of him in his garage going through yeah. old records, but I didn't see this um, – I didn't see the 20-minute one. Yeah, that was just a clip from it. Uh, oh, okay. I have to watch this whole thing then because that was, that was pretty interesting. Yeah. It's on the Denver Broncos YouTube channel. It's uh, it's pretty interesting. It'll make you like hack it more. Gives you a little bit of a, a behind-the-scenes look at their hiring process. Um, but it was just cool that they put it out there. So highly recommend. Uh, yeah. Hack it. Great sense of humor. <laughs> It just and he's genuinely like it felt like he's genuine genuinely excited to be the Broncos head coach, not just the head coach yeah. in the league, but going to a team. Uh, I think that he regards as a great organization, great fan base. He like chatted with Justin Simmons over FaceTime. Uh, maybe he's a little stage, but it, was, it still felt authentic enough. So it just made me like Hackett even more. Yeah, he seems like. Uh... He seems like a genuinely authentic dude. Yeah. And it's easy to have a good attitude in Green Bay when you're winning all the time. And it's another one to to be optimistic in Jacksonville and in, in Buffalo in those lean years. So yeah. I, I don't know. I'm impressed by the guy. Obviously, people clown on him if he's not a winner. 
and they'll turn his positive attitude into uh, it's more of a negative attribute. And they'll, they'll be like, they'll make fun of him he- relentlessly. Oh, too busy making jokes to study tape. Too busy making jokes should be grinding film, scouting yeah, too- more players. <laughs> it's like when a too player like posts hip hop uh, dancing. Yeah, a player posts Let's- a pic on vacation in the off season. They're like, yeah, you should be practicing. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, sure. No. Um, sure. I, I worked out for three hours this morning. So <laughs> my butt. Been in the film room from 3 a.m. to 9 a.m. My schedule looks like Mark Wahlberg's. Please let me have 20 minutes to sit down. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I like, I just, I like him and they couldn't have found anyone uh, more diametrically opposed, obviously, to Vic Fangio. And I think that's a good yeah. team because the, your your team takes on the head coach, the head coach's personality, um, as well as the quarterback's personality. I think so. You're halfway yep. there. I think that it'll be contagious, his attitude, and the the other thing I learned was uh, I think it was his introductory press conference, which happened after we did our podcast last week. But he was talking mm-hmm. about being. Uh, a neurobiology is that what it was neurobiology okay yeah yeah he studied it at, at uc davis he was like in his last lab like he was a class away from graduating and he was like because they asked him like why he decided to start coaching and he started the answer by and i'm paraphrasing by saying something like a lot of the people i was working with didn't find my jokes very funny and <laughs> I was like, oh God, that's my man. That's <laughs> he left <laughs> fucking neurobiology because nobody thought he was funny. And I think he could just be more of himself on a football field working with players in that environment. And he was like, Well, if I'm gonna give this a try, I better do it now before I become a boring neurobiologist. So uh fact that he looks looks uh, at humor in such high regard, Hall of Fame, put him in it, do it now. Yeah, I mean, it, it just kind of goes to show like how you can be uh, you can be on track to become a doctor, to become a neurologist, and if you don't like what you're doing, it's like okay, what's it's not going to work. You yeah. know what's the what's the point of that? Like, yeah, you have to find something that you're going you're where you're going to enjoy the little things. Yeah, and it could be as different as coaching or literally becoming a doctor. Yeah. Which I, I like to think he's more of a doctor of football now. <laughs> exactly. And Instead what, of diagnosing what, illnesses, he's diagnosing uh, defenses and coverages. Yeah. You're using the same brain power there. And with that in mind, this will be our last podcast. Yes. <laughs> God, I do not like doing this. This is not fun. <laughs> Yeah, dude, talk about two guys whose jokes never land. Oh boy, oh boy, don't they? <laughs> uh, uh, my my biggest jealousy of coaches is that they get to be outside sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and they get to completely ignore their families too. Yeah, it's like you expect of, of a head coach to be an absentee father, and they don't even have to be good. Look at no. Josh McDaniels. Getting his you third can, opportunity. You can Ruined be the worst the head coach of all time. Yeah. Pretty much. And you still get a third shot. You can the third uh, chance. You can trade away the oh God. When it, when we were writing that news script, that really kind of brought me back to when I was in middle school and early high school watching Josh goddamn McDaniels ruin the Broncos. Oh God. That, the the, the the level to which I was pissed off uh, yeah. and just devastated when he traded Jay Cutler. I, I've never felt that way um, about a transaction since then, and I never will, I, I would expect. Um, and that was before he ever coached a game. He traded Jay Cutler because he pissed off Cutler for trying to trade for Matt Castle. Yeah, And he didn't even get Castle. Castle went to the Chiefs and uh, – you made it to a Pro Bowl his second year. But um, it just reminded me how disastrous his tenure in Denver oh, was. He did everything wrong. And it, it totally, totally triggered me. 
Yeah, I I don't think he'll be that bad for the Raiders, but the fact that yeah. he quit on the the, the Colts surprises me that he's still getting gigs and opportunity. It doesn't surprise me that it's the Raiders. Uh, it's Mark Davis. Like it's kind of a wild card owner. I think they uh, like the fact that it will piss us off. Probably if he does well. Oh, the fact that sure. he's there in the first place. Yeah. I'm just glad Vic Fangio is not going there to coach defense. So I am too. That would have actually made a legitimate difference and turn, that would have turned them me. into a really, really dangerous team. Yeah. Just would have been horrible. Um, okay. So what we're trying to say is none of us actually understand how NFL head coaches get jobs. No. And the hiring process is supposed to be fair. It's supposed to be diverse. But a lot of general managers kind of have a guy that they want above all other candidates. John Elway, classic example of that, made his decision about Vance Joseph well before he interviewed anyone for that spot. Made his decision, I think, on Vic Fangio. <laughs> after talking to Vic Fangio for five minutes. And in that process, alienated Brian Flores, which leads us to this crazy lawsuit. Now, the lawsuit, the Broncos are not the feature of this lawsuit. But as a Broncos fan, I couldn't help but notice their names in here. I was like, okay, this is, this is huge that Brian Flores, he's suing the Giants, for a sham interview based on the Rooney rule where NFL teams are supposed to interview minority candidates every coaching cycle. And I think they changed that to two candidates, right? Like to try and really be like, Hey guys, no, no, no. You, we, we need more diversity at the head coaching positions across the league. Uh, so I, I opened up this lawsuit after I saw some of it. And I was like, okay, Brian Flores suing the Giants, suing the NFL. The Denver Bro – why are the Denver Broncos in there? Well, it's because I forgot that the Broncos interviewed Flores in 2019. But what's really funny, this is the official legal document that's up here on YouTube if you're watching. Yeah, and uh, anybody can access it. Yeah, it's it's online. You can read through it. But the first line in here <laughs> – Sorry, I fucked this up. I double-checked and misread the text. I think they are naming Brian Dable. I'm sorry about that, BB. Any like <laughs> civil suit that starts with sorry, I fucked up, I like. I, I like, like how they included these things like uh, blurbs on the on the front or the back of a book. Yeah. <laughs> Belichick's review like, of the lawsuit? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Um, old man texts the wrong brian yeah so what happened the reason this lawsuit is is here right mm -hmm. now is because bill belichick accidentally texted brian flores thinking he was texting brian dable congratulating him on getting the new york giants coaching job not a big deal except he accidentally texted flores three days before flores even interviewed with the giant so belichick heard dable was going to get the job they post the text messages in this legal document between flores and dable i'm trying to find them here here they are uh bill text brian sounds like you have landed congrats well, I mean, landed, that could be landed on a plane flying somewhere. Yeah. But we're assuming landed the gig for the Giants coaching job. Brian, did you hear something I didn't? Giants? Question mark? Question mark? I interview on Thursday. <laughs> I think I have a shot at it. Got it. I hear from Buffalo and New York that you are their guy. Hope it works out if you want it to. So that is Belichick covering his steps. Because that's Bel Belichick saying, "Oh no, that's he still he still doesn't know I it's think the wrong." He, Brian. he thinks it's Dable still. He still thinks it's Dable. That's right. And then Flores, that's definitely what I want. Hope you're right, Coach. Thank you, Coach. Are you talking to Brian Flores or Brian Dable? Just making sure. 
Belichick, sorry, I fucked this up. I double checked and I misread the text. I think they are naming Dable. I'm sorry about that. BB. So he's signing off. BB. Bill Belichick. Uh, so we know Belichick will end his texts from time to time as BB. Yeah. And then- the only thing that is um, hard to believe about this is Bill Belichick using all those exclamation points. Giants? Yeah, like these are some enthusiastic texts, and I, uh, I don't know. There's it's that's surprising to me. That is very, very the yeah. most shocking part of this. I'm not surprised that uh, you know a guy in his upper sixties is confusing Brian's. That's that's totally fair. Yeah. Uh, they don't look alike, which is I guess. Well, the maybe they do to Bill. Maybe Bill <laughs> maybe so doesn't not racist him, yeah. that right. Brian Dable and Brian Flores look alike to him, Will. You know, I think that's possible. That's probably mm-hmm. why he also ends up with so many white wide receivers. Um, <laughs> yeah, <that's- laughs> I, I've literally had a joke like that for the script. But uh, we also <laughs> learned here that uh, Brian Flores is on the 5G network. So his phone moves at lightning speed yeah he's um doing, he's doing all right for all himself right. yeah he's got the money to do it speaking of sports betting oh wait we didn't say sports bet we didn't have a good transition uh hey the moment you've been waiting for since september is finally here in honor of the big game DraftKings sports book an official sports betting partner of Super Bowl 56 is giving new customers 56 to 1 odds on either team. Bet just $5 and get 280 in free bets if your team wins. Not a new customer? Well, you can experience Super Bowl 56 with same game. Parlays! Combine multiple bets from the same game for a bigger payout. The more legs you add, the more money you can win. DraftKings, of course, is safe, secure, reliable. You can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. 1 a.m., you can do it. 2 a.m., you can do it. 3 a.m., you can do it. 4 a.m., you can go get some fast food from the drive-thru and then deposit or withdraw your money. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use code DNVR and 56 to 1 odds. You can get them on either team. Bet just $5 and get 280 in free bets if your team wins the super, the big game, the, the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl. I can say it. The promo code is DNVR DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of Super Bowl 56. Now, Flores, of course, was fired, surprisingly, by the Miami Dolphins. And there was interesting nuggets to come out of that, basically confirming that the Dolphins wanted to uh, tank. Yep. They, uh, The owner, Stephen Ross, Offered to pay Flores a hundred thousand dollars for every loss that season, and also that apparently Stephen Ross arranged a meeting between Brian Flores and Deshaun Watson, who was waiting for Flores in a, a marina on a yacht, alleged supposedly. I don't think Brian Flores took that meeting with Deshaun Watson. But the Dolphins were trying to force Watson on Flores. Forgive my use of verbiage there. Now, all that's crazy. You're like, oh, shit. The Dolphins are in trouble. The Giants are in trouble. He's going after the whole league to try and correct these uh, these hiring practices. And there's a lot of stuff about racism in the NFL in this document. And then I'm like, again, why are the Broncos in here? Well, let me just read you the the Denver Broncos paragraph and why why they are included as one of the main defendants. Uh, Because all the other teams are listed, but they're they're listed under like John Doe teams. So it's so weird. They get to keep their anonymity for some reason. Yeah. Which if you're already suing the NFL, uh, then it's strange not to just say who these teams were. Well, it says John Doe teams, and then it lists every team in the league. So it's <laughs> it's down here. I just it's like legal <laughs> shit. I don't understand parties. Okay, so yeah, you got the Giants, you got the Broncos. Defendant John Doe teams one through twenty nine are intended to identify NFL teams who have. So they're saying like all of these teams have engaged in 
uh, discriminatory conduct towards members of the proposed class because it's a class action lawsuit. So right. Yeah. So they're just kind of a lot of this lawsuit is kind of setting the scene and yeah. creating context for why Flores was discriminated against and, and yeah. kind of insinuating that this is the, you know, this is the output of a culture right. rather than an isolated incident, which is Correct. it's smart to do it that way. But anyway, yeah. here's the sham interview with the Broncos, here's, allegedly. Uh, 2019. Incredibly, this was not Mr. Flores's first sham interview that was held only in an effort to comply with the Rooney rule. Indeed, in 2019, Mr. Flores was scheduled to interview with the Denver Broncos. However, the Broncos then general manager, John Elway, president and chief executive officer, Joe Ellis, and others showed up an hour late to the interview. They looked completely disheveled, and it was obvious that that they had been that they had sorry and it was obvious that they had drink oop typo oh, typo <laughs> typo in the lawsuit not my dumb brain it was obvious that they had been drinking heavily the night before it was clear from the substance of the interview that Mr. Flores was interviewed only because of the Rooney rule and that the Broncos never had any intention to consider him as a legitimate candidate for the job Shortly thereafter, Vic Fangio, a white man, was hired to be the head coach. Uh, okay, Broncos. first of all, he's Italian. He's Italian. <laughs> he's the butt of it, yeah? He's not just, uh, you know, he's not Brandon Staley. He's yeah. not a uh, Wonder Bread guy over here. He's a he's a proud Italian man. Plus, he was like old as fuck when he was hired. So, like, yeah, they hired an old guy. They did not discriminate um ageism against age they're not ageist yeah. so all right i think that more than anything sheds light on the fact <laughs> that john la did not take his coaching searches very seriously no that no he did not. he had a guy and he's like all right i'm gonna make this guy interview as long as he doesn't fuck that up i'm gonna hire him and then yeah i'm just gonna get the rest of these done uh Another sham interview had to have been Kyle Shanahan then because uh, they did interview Kyle, Kyle Shanahan. Kyle Shanahan. Shanahan, the same year they hired Vic or uh, Vance Joseph. Well, so, yeah, and that's that's kind of an interesting little detail that doesn't make it into the lawsuit that the Broncos were interviewing Brian Flores to fill the head coaching vacancy left by Vance Joseph who was like their guy from the beginning so yeah. much so that they turned down uh, a very qualified yep. and a guy who would turn out to be very successful as a head coach in Kyle Shanahan. Correct. So this is a huge issue that obviously I'm not a hundred percent qualified to break down, but I think what it proves more than anything is that your relationships in the league are far more important to you getting promoted and your next jobs than maybe your qualifications are. So Brian Dable being hired by the New York Giants is not a surprise at all to me. As soon as the Giants hire are named uh, general manager Joe Shane, as their GM who came over from Buffalo, I was like, if Dable does decide he's going to leave for a head coaching job, he's going to get the Giants gig because, of course, he's going to go work with the GM who already fucking loves him, trusts mm -hmm. him. They're going to be on the same page and they can build the team. Now, that doesn't make it fair to other candidates that are going to interview for that job. Like, if they're not going to be seriously considered, then the, the Rooney rule – is completely useless in that situation. And it is like a sham and it's got to be, it's got to, it, it's got to feel like shit to go in and interview for a job that you know, you're not going to get just because of your race. And that's a big problem. I don't know if this lawsuit will actually fix it in the NFL. We've thought it's been a problem for a long time. And now we're going to get a lot of details about why it's an issue and uh, it's just, it's unfortunate that 
it's shaking out like this, but it's probably like just it's like a a big problem the NLs tried to deal with, and they've created some things that make enough people think they're they're trying to rectify it but it's not really doing anything. And now maybe they have to try harder to actually be better at helping more people build the relationships that you need in the NFL to land these gigs. But yeah, the crazy, the crazy part is for odd man sports today. Uh, Waxman wrote in a joke about um, it's like it being black history month. And this is the 100 year anniversary of the first black head coach getting a job uh, in pro football. And that 100 years later, we have come so far and progressed that there is still just one black head coach <laughs> in pro football. I was like, damn, that's a really good joke. And then this comes out. I'm like, oh, shit. It's it's so like it's a good joke because it's so fucking true and real and sad at the same time. But. Uh, the other caveat there is if John Elway didn't show up to that meeting hungover, I would be worried. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is only a problem if you can prove that they didn't show up an hour late and disheveled and possibly hung over for every yeah. other coaching interview. I assume sure. that's how they uh, attack most of their, uh, meetings or interviews or events. Well, yeah, we <laughs> should. Yeah, like the, we've known that LA likes to drink for years. Yes, this is not. Uh, it is not a well kept. Not secret surprising in yeah. Denver. Um, no, <laughs> and not at I, all. I feel like that interview happened the day after they interviewed Fangio. I could be wrong, mm -hmm. but I feel like they were out eating dinner, celebrating probably with Fangio drinking late. And then they went into this interview and they probably still reeked of like, oh yeah, we're trying to get our shit together. The right. other problem there is if you are somebody who likes to go out and drink, why would you schedule an interview that did not give you enough time to recover from your hangover? Yeah. You have to schedule your interviews for like 2 PM at the earliest. Minimum. The older you get, the longer those hangovers last too. That's true. So maybe like 2 AM the following day. Yeah. Sometimes you think it's over, and then an hour yeah. later, your body feels even worse. So uh, it's just things I am looking forward to in the future. Do you think this hurts Elway's chances of landing the ownership bid? Oh, I don't, because Joe Ellis is going to decide who gets <laughs> to buy the fucking team. Oh, wow. That's yeah, again, crazy. like this is not shocking in the least. No, the drunk We've stuff. We've known this. Certainly I... not. And I think it's it's fair to say, though, that... <laughs> it's a million videos of John Elway being drunk yeah. in public. It's fair to say that Elway made his decision before the interview. Yeah. The interview happened because of Brian Flores' race, but he didn't not get the job because of his race. Right. Those are like a couple of things. There's a couple of layers there you got to figure out. There's so many layers to the uh, to this situation, which like it, the lawsuit does not address, um, I think, adequately. But you go ahead. Oh, I had no more to say there. Oh, OK. <laughs> well, I think it's just kind of silly. And I haven't you know, I haven't read every word of this, but um, for everything I've seen, at least. Uh, they don't mention the fact, and why would they, obviously? Because um, it would probably hurt their case. But I think a, a big reason why there there's only one out of 32 black head coaches in the league. And by the way, there's they also mentioned there's six out of 32 black GMs. Um, but which is kind of like, I don't know. I don't know what that says about their case. But um, – Who's getting hired? Like, who are the hot head coaching hires right now? Like, what kind of coach? Any coach say? who is age 31. Yeah, young guys, young guys on what side of the ball? It's the, the, the hottest 
coaching candidates are based on the coaching trees right now. It's anybody mm -hmm. coming out from underneath Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay. Those are the people everybody wants at the moment. <laughs> and it's going to be Zach Taylor moving forward to, especially if the Bengals win the Super Bowl. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like Bill Callahan or Bill Callahan, Brian Callahan will be the next guy from that lineage. But so really uh, Zach Taylor, Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay, they need to be better at hiring more black coaches underneath them. Yeah, kind of. Cool? I mean, I was going to say, though, like these are all just like young offensive masterminds who are getting head coaching gigs because uh, that's just the way the NFL is headed. And so the answer is not to force teams to hire, um, you know, defensive coordinators. And there are more – I'm – this is going off of um, – just like an initial scan, but it looks like there are more black defensive coordinators than are than there are black offensive, offensive coordinators. coordinators. Um, you can fact check me if you want, but uh, the the way to do it is not to force them to hire defensive coaches because if they don't want to do that, that, that makes plenty of sense. It's to um, kind of gather like a, a a crop of young black offensive co coaches. And yeah. another, I mean, it kind of, it's kind of linked to the fact that there's always um, a lower percentage of black quarterbacks because, you know, a lot of the best offensive coaches um, were, you know, backup quarterbacks in the NFL. So these, all yeah. these things are kind of linked and there's just so many layers to it that to simplify it um, like they're doing in this lawsuit, um, I don't think is totally helpful. And even like, like Kyle Shanahan didn't play in the NFL his dad was an NFL head coach. Like mm -hmm. a lot of candidates are guys who grew up. I feel like around coaching and ball boys, former ball you, boys, fucking ball boys is the, the you got to be the ball, ball boys boy. around the world. Um, Sean McVay didn't play in the NFL, right? Like, did he? No, they all played in college, he played college football. Yeah. Um, it's a, a lot of, I feel like a lot of, it, Coaches who don't coach like after they play in the NFL, they're guys who just couldn't make it in the NFL. You know what I mean? As well, it's it's a complicated uh, freaking network of, of people and how you get into coaching. And then there are just like there are weird owners who are going to go out and hire Josh McCown to be their head coach for some reason. You know what I mean? Who's had? Yeah, yeah. It's He's like, a quarterback. It's not a, it's not a stretch to like to understand why that's happening when you look at uh, who uh, what's his name is. Who's the the Texans bald guy? What's his name? Jack Easterby. Yeah, Jack Easterby. It's not like a stretch to figure out what Jack Easterby and Josh McCown have in common. <laughs> yeah, They're both deeply Super religious. religious. Yeah. Um, so guys, guys hire. I mean, it's it's. It's the same as any other working environment. Like people hire people who are like them and who they want to work with and yeah. who they get along with and, and probably to an extent who they look like. Um, yeah. So that, well, and that doesn't make it right. It's just we have to – I think you have to think about this on a deeper level to understand yeah. how, to, how to change it because obviously one out of 32 head coaches being black is like – it's a failure and it's so like it's so deeply skewed um, based on a player population that is 70 percent black. Yeah. And it's like it, you got to figure out how many, you know, maybe former players decide they want to get into coaching and mm -hmm. how guys who don't make it into the NFL want to get into coaching. It's, it's like they need like a program to de help develop young guys that want to be coaches Right. Outside of just like working for a team without making any money, sacrificing years of your life, doing shit work. Like that's the way you get like if you're not in the NFL, that's the way you get in for a lot of those jobs. Oh, but, yeah. It's horrible, at, horrible underpaid work for most of your career as a coach. Yeah. Uh, and you got to move. If you have you're moving around, you're moving your family around, changing teams like it's a yeah. it's a weird industry. Uh, I don't, I don't think it's like, it's a normal hiring industry. Uh, 
doesn't mean they can't figure out a better way to do it. And it just doesn't seem like they've actually put in a good effort to think about how to actually correct it. It's the way the NFL does things like, Oh, we're, we're getting, we're getting heat about this thing. We'll just, uh, we'll do this and it will slap this on it and it'll mm-hmm. get a, get everybody off our back for a while. We will, uh, you know, whatever controversy X, let's throw some money at it. Let's get a good PR campaign going and it'll go away after a while. It's kind of the way to deal with it. Yeah. And one thing the lawsuit brings up that I think I agree with and and you would too. And I think most people would probably say the same thing is it like, it really accuses the NFL of pandering with all these initiatives that they, you know, publicize, oh, right. but don't follow through with like, it's like, you know, end racism, uh, etched into the back of the end zone, like stop hate on the back of players helmets. It's so, it's so, it's so empty and hollow, especially yeah. when you look at the results where yeah, one like out of 32 we, head coaches are black. Right. And like, even when we learned like how much money of the breast cancer awareness month was going to actual yeah. work <laughs> to help. You know what I mean? It was like, they fuck up like every time with the, with this stuff. And I get it's a huge league. It's kind of crazy. But if you look at, you know, the current Broncos coaching situation, they bring in Nathaniel Hackett. Hackett's looking to guys that he's worked with in the league to fill positions on his staff. That's where, like, that's where he's going to go first for the most important jobs, right? Offensive yeah. coordinator, defensive coordinator. And... I don't think it has anything to do with anything other than who he's worked with, who he has relationships with. That's who he wants to bring in first. And if enough uh, of those candidates aren't black, then you're going to fill coordinator roles with guys who can't have that next step to get to the head coaching position. Um, So it's like he wanted Getsy because he worked with him in the Packers and Stenovich. And it's not going to get either of those guys now because the Stenovich going over to the Bears and then Getsy's getting promoted to OC. Yeah, so now they're, think- you know, now they're interviewing Clint Kubiak, which is kind of I'm- another testament to how the NFL works. Yep. Gare, uh, George Payton has a relationship with Clint Kubiak based on their time together in Minnesota. So, yeah. and the Broncos have a connection. long relationship with Gary. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's relationships. It's why it's so easy to predict where guys will go sometimes in these big hiring spots. Um, but anyway, who is, uh, who is the defensive coordinator the Broncos wanted? Oh, um, it's the guy from the Rams. Yeah. Right. And so they can't, figure it out to begin with or they can't they can't figure it out until after the uh yeah wasn't the defense he's the passing game coordinator well i think he has like a defensive title and passing game coordinator right yeah zero evero and right he and hackett at some point they have a there's a connect there's a connection there somewhere so the nfl released a statement that that got got posted like just a minute ago Um, so I'll just read off of it. Yeah. Give me that. The NFL and our clubs are deeply committed to ensuring equitable employment practices and continue to make progress in providing equitable opportunities throughout our organization. Diversity is core to everything we do. And there are a few issues on which our clubs and our internal leadership teams spend more time. We will defend against these claims, which are without merit. The only sentence that matters in that statement is the last one. We will defend against these claims, which are without merit. Everything else is just like word soup with a bunch of buzzwords and, and, you know, yeah, diversity and blah, blah, blah. Things every business says, but doesn't like totally mean. So do you think this hurts Flores's chance of getting a head coaching job? Will right now. (laughs) Yeah, I would say yes. (laughs) I would say, um, Usually, historically, especially in uh, recent years, um, uh, filing lawsuits against the NFL does not help your chances of employment within the NFL. 
Yeah. Can Gruden lump his lawsuit in too? I was just going to say. <laughs> I so, would, but Gruden is actually mentioned in this lawsuit. Oh, wow. So here's... Uh, okay, so Evero and Hackett were teammates at the University of California, Davis. Boom. Right down the there's street the, from me. See, like that's, like, that's the whole thing. It's so relationship-based. That was the point we were trying to yeah. make. And I think the that's NFL, like the, the real, like that might be because the, the number of black head coaches is going to, um, it's going to change obviously from year to year. And th- it's especially like jarring now because they just fired Flores and, and David Coley. And I don't know if they, if anybody else got fired recently. And then they were replaced by white guys. So this year's number is obviously going to look um, really, really bad. But I think like nepotism, nepotism is it's kind of a reality to the point where it's not even worth addressing. But um, they kind of go hand in hand in a way, because like if you have 31 white head coaches right now and they're, you know, and you realize that hiring is a process of, of networking and relationships and who knows who it's like, obviously a bunch of white head coaches are going to give way to a bunch more white head coaches because right. that's who they have the strongest relationships with, whether you like it or not. That's, that's kind of the, the reality. And so you can't really have that discussion without, you know, talking about how nepotistic it is too. Yeah, no, that's fair. And it's like, also, some head coaching gigs are going to suck. Oh yeah. The Texans, the Texans job, the Jaguars job, like do you like nobody wants those gigs? Not and <laughs> it's just yeah, it's NFL's a crazy crazy beast. I'm glad I do not work in the NFL. Uh coaching's crazy you got to have a good quarterback or your chances of being a good head coach are screwed from the beginning but anyway we'll see how this plays out obviously the broncos there's gonna be like they got to hire their coordinators they've got a whole sale they're gonna do maybe there's a free agent play for a quarterback although that feels more and more unlikely the longer shit goes right now and uh yeah appreciate you guys listening it's a long podcast, unexpected on a Tuesday. Oh, can I mention really quickly? Because um, I think I said there are 31 white head coaches. That is not true. There are just 31 non-black head coaches. Oh. Plus factoring in a couple of vacancies. Because you got Ron Rivera and you got Robert Sala, who um, right. do not identify as being white. Correct. And of course, Dan Campbell transcends race. <laughs> Dan Dan Campbell. Uh, Dan Campbell's yeah. racial identity is football. Yeah, <laughs> his skin color is pig skin. His his driver's license just yeah, it says yeah. football. Yeah. Race football, height <laughs> football, <laughs> sex football. <laughs> Are you an organ donor? Cannibal. Just like whoa, dude. <laughs> Kneecaps. Kneecaps. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I'm glad you made it through the podcast. Thanks for listening. Good night. And John Elway was drunk, so drunk that he didn't need an ACL in that interview. John Elway's ACL is not racist. And good luck.